Right. What do you think makes a functional team? <laughs> Talk about a question right off the bat, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> apart, apart from quality people. Yeah. Um, actually, but, um, just as like a, a, a preemptor before I answer the question, I think it's something you said the other day, right? It's not about a group of people who work together. It's about a people who group of people who work together and trust each other when yes. working together. So I think we should just frame that with Frank B saying <laughs> that. Um, but I, I subscribe to um, Patrick Lencioni's model of the of five dysfunctions. So even the highest performing team has dysfunctions. Yeah, and I, I think of sport teams as well. You know, players don't always get on, but they can still be high performing. And the model equates these five core qualities that if a team doesn't resolve, it will dysfunction in. And it starts with something you and I have talked about on a number of occasions on Real Talk. And it's an absence of trust. What are we like when we need to share things with each other? And I'm not just talking about intimate things. Oh, my, my cat isn't well. This is about how, how I think you're doing. Because the next one, next to absence of trust, is the fear of conflict. Can you and I have healthy conflict? If you don't like how I'm doing something, do you just moan to the boss? Do you complain to the other team members and like gang up a little bit? Or can you come and say to me, hey, Brad, can we have five minutes? I, I just want to talk about the way things went in that meeting. And I don't get defensive. I'm able to go, yeah, Frank, what's going on? Tell me. And then I take the feedback. So you have this absence of trust. And if you don't have trust, you can't have conflict. So for me, those are definitely the first two. And then I think it grows to a lack of commitment. And, and without these layers at the bottom, you don't get the layers at the top. So it's like a pyramid, right? Yes, it really is related. It builds on each other, doesn't it? Right. I think we call it like it's compound. If you don't have one, you can't have the other. So you have to work on the first thing. And the first thing is built on a foundation of trust. Then it's about the ability to have conflict. And then it's about a focus on commitment. What is your, you know, we've talked about like having team agreements before in a team. How, a team charter, if you like, you know. Yes. How, how do we operate? What's our purpose? What are we trying to do? By the end of next year, what would have made us successful? So we've got trust, we've got conflict, we've got commitment, and then we focus more on results. So those three things need to be in play, and then it's about results. And, and the first thing is, are we accountable? Are we prepared to take responsibility and accountability for delivering our part of the business? Ultimately, yeah. It lends itself to, if you're accountable, then your focus and attention is on results. And that for me is something like a dashboard for every team measuring what we do every week, every month, every quarter. So in three seconds, if you're my boss, you can come in, you can look at the dashboard. Okay, green light, team's doing well. And for me, this makes a great team. Trust, the ability to have it. Conflict the ability to have it, <laughs> commitment, total focus, accountable, and uh, attention on results. And if those five things are in play, I think you have a high-performing team. Yeah, I agree. But you know what? I think uh, the, the model is relatively well-known uh, because it's based on a book. I forgot actually the name of the author right now. Yeah, Patrick Lencioni. Right, exactly. So... Um, <clears throat> It's, or it's not a new book either, so it's been around for a while. But I think what some people actually confuse from time to time is the accountability uh, bit. Because this is a talk, uh, when we talk about functional teams, that is about um, the dynamics inside the team. So accountability is not so much about, in this context, not so much about am I accountable for uh, my commitment. It's also the ability to hold each other accountable for the behaviors and commitments that, that we have made. It's very much related also to the ability to actually having conflict in the sense of a you know, courageous um, debate with candor, isn't it? So, right. 
Um, that, that's, I think, the, uh, the key thing that's often, I think, overlooked, right? It's not just about me, because when you talk about what makes a great team, you have to be able to hold each other accountable. And I think that's the skill here. Well, and, and, and you and I, we, we were on a workshop, uh, you know, the other day, and we were talking about radical candor. Um, that ability to say things as they are without people taking it personally. No. Uh, maybe, maybe that's the real challenge, right? You know, it's how do you say things without people taking it personally? So maybe there's a link, right, to that accountability with each other and the fact that we need to be able to have a healthy conflict. But I'm interested from, from your perspective, you manage big, diverse, disparate, virtual, remote, co-located teams in, in your time. You kind of had the whole spread that you had to deal with. How, yeah. how, how did you get them to own that accountability so that it wasn't you calling up every day? Hey, have you done this? Hey, have you done this? Hey, did you do that? You said you were. You know, how, how do you do that? Because if if you're a manager who's constantly calling up to say, hey, how's it going? Have you done that? It becomes micromanagement. How did you get teams to own that accountability? Well, in principle, it starts with yourself, of course. In case you are the team leader or the manager or the director, or whatever you are, but as soon as you're the, the front figure of a team, it starts definitely with yourself. If you are micromanaging people, that's what everybody else will learn from that's how things are done around here so someone you know said to me in the past and maybe it was even you years ago i don't remember so much anymore is you have to um, start with granted trust that's your starting point so you don't assume the other one somewhere down the line is going to screw you over or is going to i don't know in a work environment is just going to check facebook but not really do something or something you know what whatever's in your yeah. head yeah. about this so you start with everyone who comes on board was granted trust that's a starting point that's maybe not all that that you need to do but i think it's a super important one because as we just discussed this whole thing about those five elements of how do you actually create a functional team starts with trust as the basis and because of its pyramid nature that's what needs to be in place first so, I'm yeah. sorry, then, uh, then there are, I, I need to allow people to be honest and vulnerable, as they say, I think it's a modern vocabulary here, really, vulnerable about um, maybe their mistakes or their problems that they have, you know, in a project or during work or maybe even privately or whatever it is without being judged or sanctioned uh, for it. So there is this atmosphere of openness and all of that contributes to the, the base level, the trust. I mean, there's more, more than that, but I've, I see in your face that you want to say something. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing you and I think it's, it's this, you know, when you talk about that kind of deep trust, that, that swift trust, we need, we need to almost give it. Um, when, if I'm joining a team, so I'm thinking, you know, teams are constantly changing, changing, and I'm thinking about the environment we're living in right now, where we're virtual, you know? But when you and I w were working in the last 10 years, teams were normally co-located, we had orientations and onboarding in offices, we would meet, connect with people. I, I wonder what that's like now when I'm joining your team virtually and you and I may never have even met. Um, I definitely haven't met the team. The only place I've met them is on a screen. Yeah. I wonder what happens then to your point of, you know, just giving that trust to somebody. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. I think it makes things a little bit harder. But when you think about having seriously implemented or trying to implement you know those five components of a functional team you also have the bit at the end that's focus on results mm. so i can trust someone blindly without having a reason to because i don't know you yet i allow you to how do you say to be vulnerable about saying hey frank um 
I have problems with this, I'm behind my deadline, uh, I'm struggling with A and B without me screaming at you. Thank you. <laughs> right? So, <clears throat> but in the end, I, I don't need to micromanage you, have you send me a daily report over email, uh, you know, all the time or something like that to keep, you know, a sense of uh, control. I will in the end see in results whether you're, you're okay, whether you're on track as a contributor, contributor to the team, right? I mean, of course, with you personally, I might want to check in and see, I don't know how things are going and I want to do this proactively also, not in a micromanaging way, but in a caring and supportive way. But in the end, I'm not going to doubt. I'm not, I'm not going to doubt that you're going to lead up to the results um, that you have committed to. I'll hold you accountable for it. But you will have the liberty to say, I think I'm having trouble meeting my commitment because I need help here and there along the way. Right? So I'm, I would ask you, okay, Brett, was it, what is it? Let, let me see if I can help. And uh, so I think this is how, in the end, all these three things come together, sorry, all these five things come together. So whether you're remote or not, I don't think it makes such a difference. The only thing is uh, some people need more of a human connection than others. So, and if you're one of those who need it more, this need is probably a little bit elevated right now. So you need more confirmation about that you've been doing a good job or having completed a task well or something like that. How much of the great teams do you think finds its way to the leadership of the team? Uh, excuse me, say that again, ask that again. How, how much of a successful team's success do you think rests with the leadership? I was attributed to the leadership. Mm. Um, there's a, on the day-to-day -day basis, very little. Mm. Because the leader is not doing the work. He's not the expert in the things that need to be done over the course of a project or an initiative or a campaign or whatever you're working on as a team. No, for, for, for you, it's really more about making sure that the team is functional, that they get the support that they need. And that is actually a constant engagement. Mm. So... As a leader of a team, you're busy all the time, but not necessarily, unless you're also a contributor as part of the project. But your, your leadership role in itself is something that is not, how do you say? If you've done this right in the beginning and over the course of, uh, of the project where this group of people actually becomes a team, then the remaining success rests on the shoulders of the uh, contributors yeah yeah and and i suppose the leader's job and again we've talked about leadership is to set the direction the team engage with how we're going to get there and then the leader enables the team to act and yes. maybe that great teamwork the leader's job is about setting setting the the the, the path um Another thing, when you were just talking there, and I was thinking, we haven't mentioned fun yet. Um, you know, what makes a great team? Maybe a team that can have fun together, you know, that can share yeah. and enjoy being together. And, and even when I say it out loud, I wonder, is, is that true? Do we need to have fun together? I think it's built in to having achieved a genuine trust people mm -hmm. will have fun with each other the moment they actually can trust each other truly this will automatically happen no matter how you know um grim and data focused the individuals are on the team the moment they trust each other they find they find occasions for humor all the time it was always a gallows humor, we call it in the, in the UK, in my teams. Where, you know, <laughs> if you were going to go to the gallows and, and it was your execution, it was like the kind of humor there because the kind of teams I was involved with, <laughs> we would always, the humor would be brutal. <laughs> yeah. No, look, you know, you see some of those things happening when, you know, 
people in the team are poking fun maybe about the weaknesses of the other, but then both laugh genuinely because, and it, this, this only happens if, uh, you know, both individuals that are having fun together and maybe are pranking each other or something like that over the course of um, their, their working together is that they know that the other person uh, doesn't mean them harm or bad or something like that. So there's, it's a very, very safe environment. And that's actually why it's at the bottom of that pyramid. Trust is the number one thing, and I believe. I mean, maybe you should be able to know that too, because you've been you know, coaching a lot of teams. That is exactly the component that rarely is in place the way it needs to be, trust. Oh, Frank, um, I think if I look at most of the teams where we're called in to do some work of some sort, it's because trust is missing in that deep level that you're describing. Yeah. It, it's there from a point of view of, of credibility. You know, we have the equation for trust where we look at credibility, reliability, and intimacy as three or four different variables. And I think in most teams, even the way you've been describing it this morning and, and with the pyramid itself, I think most teams can recognize credibility and reliability, right? You're good at what you do, so you're technically proficient or excellent at your yeah. job. You're reliable, so when I say to you, hey, Frank, I'll have it to you by Friday, 9 o'clock, you get it by Friday, 9 o'clock, or I'm messaging you with a, a proper reason of why it's not happening without fear of consequence. So I'm reliable. And I think that's really easy. The credibility and the reliability are the easiest elements. For me, it's the other variables in the trust equation that makes this trust so difficult for teams. It's the intimacy. So can we create this you were talking about safe environment. Can we create a safe environment for people to want to share or to joke in the way we were describing? And the other variable is, is self-orientation. You know, when I'm talking in the team, is the focus always on me? You know that uh, you're coming to the end of a 45-minute team meeting and you ask your team, so... Guys, looks like uh, we finished our agenda. Um, does anybody have anything else uh, they want to bring up? And it's always the same person who does have something to bring up, normally for like 20 minutes. It's normally the same thing they've talked about every week. And, and you can sometimes see the, like the people in the team, like the eyes go to the top of the head or they, they lean back. And this is when you know you need to work both on trust in the team and also with the individual. And, and I think one thing that's missing when I look at teams to build this trust is the opportunity for people to be prepared to share stuff about themselves that's got nothing to do with work, like nothing yeah. to do with work at all, like a, a, a personal histories. Like, uh, I don't know, um, what was the worst thing that happened to them when they were a teenager? For example, mine was definitely being grounded for uh, playing truant from school and being caught by my parents. <laughs> yeah. They found out. <laughs> and that was like three weeks where I wasn't allowed out. It was the worst. <laughs> really not a good, not a good time. Um, but sharing, you know, these little stories, which I think just makes for people understanding each other a bit more. I don't know what you think when, when you look at your teams that you managed how you got that intimacy level up to develop that deep trust. Yeah, so I think the, the intimacy, I'm, I'm actually sometimes not, not so sure what's the uh, chicken and what's the egg in this question. But probably it really depends on how the team came together and, when, what, and what state they're in. So if people come to, on the team that are generally wired to you know, first of all, trust the other guy, maybe until they disappoint them, but mm. that's how they start. Then this, you know, sharing about, you know, your, your life, your stories, um, you know, your interests and whatever creates some sort of intimacy, uh, possibly also leading to friendship, this kind of automatically starts. You don't have to force it a lot because the people start from a perspective of, of trust. Mm -hmm. Of course, it helps 
to have that trust confirmed over time through the things that you mentioned also, for example, through reliability, through you know, um, being committed to the things that you said you would do, integrity and so on. All those, all those components play a role. Um, the question is just how do you get back to or get to actually trusting when a team is together that doesn't truly trust each other? That is the much, much harder part. And I think then starting, although it probably feels very weird, um, probably starting with, I don't know, giving each other a little bit of speaking time about, you know, tell them, tell the rest of the team about, you know, yourself, um, some things from the past or your interests or your hobbies or whatever that creates connections somehow. I think this, uh, this may help, right? I, uh, I worked with one team um, that were spread across uh, Northern Europe. And we did an exercise called Working With Me. And everybody had to write um, a one slide or a one page handbook on how to get the best out of working with me. And they all had to stand up and present like uh, their highlights of their career, the lowlights of their career. The worst thing you can do to me in a team that will totally switch me off from wanting to contribute. The way to get the best out of me in the team, these four headings. And then what I bring, what value do I bring to the team and how will I frustrate the team? So these six categories. Yeah. <laughs> then they stand up and share and then they distribute them ar around the team. And then the team get into little groups and discuss. <laughs> right, I love this because it's kind of gamifying this experience. Mm -hmm. And probably it's also based on, uh, you know, some, you know, team exercise on personality profiling. So uh, they can learn how to work with each other and understand the different characters. And, but I love this, uh, I love this idea. I think it's super funny writing a one or two page manual on how to operate me. Like, right. if, you were, like if you were a microwave. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, especially, and every right. time you come, you know, a new member comes into the team, you can't run the session over and over again, but the new member gets all the people's manual yeah. and they have to present one. And, you know, I've been in sports teams where when someone new joins the team, at the end of the first training session in the dressing room, you know, they have to stand up on the, on the benches and they have to sing a song uh, or something like this, right? Or, or we throw them in, in the bath if they're, or the showers if, there's, uh, if you're lucky enough in uh, non-professional football to have showers. Um, but yeah, in, in teams, I think this manual, owner's manual, we'll call it, uh, when there's an owner's manual, it is, it's, it's gamifying and it steps away from kind of the, the detail orientation of a psychometric profile, which of course is valuable. You know, we'll, we, we promote that. We both work with them. Um, but this idea of, and then there's something there which is really easy to digest, easy to understand. And actually, you know, you're writing there. These are the things that I will do that will frustrate you. No. Yeah. The honesty that comes out, of course, it creates that, that level of honesty, but that intimacy and trust. And I can trust you if I know you can see your blind spots. And actually, another really cool game way of doing that kind of thing is you finish a meeting, like you come together for a team meeting, and you just ask people to give feedback on what they really appreciate about the other members of the team. Yeah. I watched, Frank, I watched one team, right? And they were all co-located, so it wasn't virtual or, or in different offices, so it was much easier. The manager um, invited them in for their monthly team meeting. And when they sat down, he said, right, guys, today there's no work agenda. We're just going to play together as a team. And around the wall, he had post, uh, post it, a uh, flip chart paper with everybody's name on it. There was a small circle in the bottom, and the rest of the page was just free. And in front of everybody on the, on the table were these like um, pens and, and uh, felts and crayons and things like this. And for their half hour team meeting that day, people just walked around and wrote things that they appreciated about everybody else in the team on the flip chart. So you'd have your flip chart with Frank on it and we'd all go around and we'd write the things we appreciate. 
and then we'd write, we only had this small bit at the bottom for things you do that are frustrating, has to be balanced. Yeah. And then at the end of the team meeting, the manager asked everybody to take their flip chart and put it behind their desk. And it was ah, I see, nice. Right? As a reminder, and when you're speaking with the other person, you go like, ah, he's actually always punctual. <laughs> No, it was know, just, but, but it was just lovely, right? It was yeah. such a nice touch. Um, so I think there are lots of things that you can do that kind of harness this idea of the trust, the conflict, the commitment to each other yeah. that makes the great teams. And, and for me, what it highlights in listening to you and then hearing back what I'm saying, I think the responsibility of the leader isn't so much in the doing. It's in the making time for the team to connect. Yes, I agree with that. Totally. It's, uh, this is, it's not necessarily about, you know, having enough uh, offsite meetings with fun. It's the day to day, you know, that's a, that's the thing. That's your, that's your job. If you do that right, then uh, your team has all the room, all the space to be at their best. And to be honest, you know what, I think maybe I'm going too far with this, but I believe that if you actually truly manage inside a team to genuinely trust each other, most of the other things that are following that are needed, the ability to have healthy conflict, to call something out that you don't agree with, uh, the ability to uh, get a buy-in from the team about decisions that are made, holding each other accountable, and then also focus on results become, I'm not going to say they come automatic, but I think they're going to come so much easier. Yeah, I think, um, uh, actually, I don't think it. Uh, I know you're right. Because in 20 years of working with teams, when that is in play, teams fly. Yeah. Well, let, let's turn this around a little bit. What are telltale signs of a dysfunctional team when you observe them from the outside? Oh, that's a great question. There'll be people watching and listening to this now who might be a bit uh, nervous when they hear some of them. But you know what? I think the first thing is a team that doesn't share. And I'm talking about sharing even to the point of sharing what their priorities are. I'm working on my own. This is my bit. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is my kingdom. Please don't come in. <laughs> What's the password? Don't come to my desk, you know? <laughs> What's um, the password for talking with me? <laughs> well, you know, I'm saying it with a smile, but actually there are teams uh, like that. Um, I think teams where you can visibly see that people are not connecting beyond the work. I think this is a telltale sign. So... They are functioning, but dysfunctional. So actually, you've got a group of individuals who maybe are all doing it. And again, this is a little bit down to the leader, bringing them together. So it's that lack of disconnection, that lack of connection that people have. So this is my kingdom. That's one. That's about a bit about personality type. Then there's the lack of connection, which I think lends itself to the, the leader's role a little bit. And I'll tell you something else I've observed. Teams that don't ever celebrate, where they're not given the chance to acknowledge a success or a, a win, however big or small, where they don't stop and go, do you know what, let's drink a toast to, to what we achieved there. So teams that don't set goals and then don't celebrate, for me, I think these are teams that are less productive, less effective, because it reminds me of, of, of Alice in Wonderland, you know, the great book. If, if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter how you get there. You'll, you'll get somewhere. True. But it might not be where you want to go. And I think that direction that the team chooses, that breathing life into it by the connections and the fact that I don't run a team, uh, I'm not part of a team, thinking this is my silo, this is what I do, Frank, that's what you do, can you stay over there? Um, and the final thing I would add to that, <laughs> and I've seen this before, when teams work together and there's a challenge, they send each other emails. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, I don't want to create an audit trail with you, Frank. I'm going to ping you a little WhatsApp with a voice audio so you can hear my tone straight away and go, hey, Frank, listen, I'd really like to talk to you about this. Uh, I'm, I'm stuck with it I, I, and I need something from you. And then you're going to know, right? And, and then either you ghost me <laughs> and then we've definitely got a problem um, or you come back to me straight away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When should we meet? Yeah. So, yeah, if, if I'm sending you a long email and I'm CCing or BCCing my manager, because that's another one, right? Anyone who uses BCC, I think anyone who blind copies, it's not a great team. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's so true. So, you know, I ask, let me add a few things. So, I uh, maybe as I said earlier, I think it's a telltale sign is uh, no humor, no banter. Mm. You know, in the moments before maybe the meeting starts and people are gathering or, you know, after, if there's if just complete absence of that, I would at least have a question mark right. saying, and thinking, I don't think, I don't, people that actually know and trust each other are usually not very cold with each other. <laughs> you know, so that is something that would actually be a telltale sign for me. Or if you go into a team and have a chance to speak with everyone individually and uh, absolutely everyone can tell you stories about commitments not upheld in the past. So people often have this, this long history uh, of where, you know, they're proving to each other over and over again that it's that, like, I'm right not trusting you, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the things you did since 10 years ago when we first met and so on. But it never went out really in the open. And uh, even if it was it was in the open, the other person who had did not have the openness to accept because their 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 own ego needed to protect itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if you if you find a lot of history in commitments not met, even if the person you speak to wouldn't admit out loud that they don't trust the other person, uh, but then it means exactly that. You've uh, you triggered a thought for me which is actually teams don't necessarily need to all like each other to be a successful team, but they do have to be able to work together. So if there's one person who's not liked by anybody, that's obviously a problem because it breaks the team dynamic. But you know, in, in a lot of teams, you might have personalities that don't quite connect, they clash. Yes, And I can think right. of, of a football team I managed a, a number of years ago. And the two people who played striker, the two women, they did not get on with each other. Actually, they, they genuinely disliked each other. But on the pitch, Frank, they were awesome together. And in this year, uh, the team won promotion from the third division to the second division. These two people scored like more than 50 goals between them. They made goals for each other. They celebrated together on the pitch. But before the game, <laughs> they never spoke. They didn't say goodbye to each other when they left the park. If they were out with other players, they were like moaning about the other person. I don't like what they do. I don't like what... But on the pitch, they were brilliant together. Yeah, that's great. And it's actually a good story for uh, showing how... Um, because apparently they needed to trust each other in, in the context of how they were working together or playing right. together in this example. Mm, that's super, super important. I also I can remember having had um, or, or being part of a team where there was a person, two or three, that I didn't particularly like, but when I could respect them, mm -hmm. uh, then that was not a problem at all. You know, sometimes, you know, my... Uh, personal sense of humor or I don't know wanting to talk with someone in a lightweight fashion or something that doesn't sit well with everyone uh, you know it's just characters are different personalities are different it's fine you don't need to invite everyone you meet to your next birthday party no. but having the knowing that uh, you can trust the person that he'll be okay if you're open uh, about you know, things that uh, maybe problems you run into, we're still talking about team, right? So meaning all of them have 
a goal, something that they want to achieve, that they're committed to. And if I know if this commitment is there, and if I know that uh, I can trust them in, the, in, in this context, uh, then I, I don't necessarily need to be best friend. No, and actually uh, to that point, if we try and force that, the opposite happens. You can actually create more dysfunction as a leader, trying to force people to be friends when actually it's better to help them understand how they can respect each other to deliver no. and feel part of something, even if they're not connected. Like you say, you don't need to invite everyone to your birthday party. Yeah. Um, uh, I love let me, that. Let me add one last sign, which I think is a telltale sign. So if you have a bit of a larger group, let's say 10 people, mm -hmm. and they're supposed to work together as a team, and you have two or three that really seem to so form some sort of subgroup. So they talk privately with each other, not bringing something in the open that they may jointly disagree with in the larger content of the team, context of the team. Uh, they are, I don't know, without explanation, they always vote unanimously against stuff and so on. And I think you have, you have actually two teams. <laughs> One is the, the people who kind of play by the rules of the openness, the trusting, the bringing, you know, the healthy conflict and so on. And the other one who are just not playing. They, they're just in their own game. So they're politicizing usually their own agenda. Um, why is a different uh, question? That's probably also complex. But that's a, to me, that's a sign. If there's always a part that continues to, di you know, distance themselves in their body language, in the way they act and speak, in the way they text each other during the meeting. Um, and, and so on. I think that is a bit of a telltale sign that there's something's not all right. There's a subtlety to that that is actually innately dangerous as well, because you can feel it in a room. Just as you can feel the, the, the radical candor and the transparency of warmth, so you can feel that you know if you were to join a meeting of my team and there were two people playing like this you would you would notice it straight away you'd be no. like brad what's uh, what's going on with those two and i'd be like oh frank i don't know what to do with them because and exactly as you've just uh, described it no. it seems as though for the leader and the team actually there are fairly clear signposts for what makes an effective team um, and maybe to become successful as a team, we need to become effective first so that we operate as the team, you know, greater than the sum of the parts. Um, I think uh, it almost feels as though we've come full circle. <laughs> <laughs> it almost feels like it. You know what, uh, but uh, I mean, this is a really big subject uh, somehow because on the, on the outside, building and becoming a highly functional team is actually very simple. But then doing it can sometimes be incredibly hard and also take a long time. Because we're, we're talking about that people not only have to work on themselves, <coughs> and also with each other, that is not necessarily always easy. Maybe let me add one last, you know, the I think the most obvious telltale sign that you have a dysfunctional team is when you have lots of blaming. With blaming, I don't mean like, you know, the healthy conflict of uh, the accountability of saying that, you know, something didn't work as it, sh as it should have had. But I wanted to particularly have everyone in the team know that you, Brad, actually screwed up and that my not performing is actually your fault. Yeah. If yes, that's going you. on, there's a really big fracture. And, and actually, that could either be privately where uh, you're coming to me as the manager saying, hey, listen, uh, if, could you get Brad to do his work because I can't do what I meant to do without it? Or actually, even worse, calling it out uh, in, in the team meeting in a way that is divisive. Yeah. And it's often it's that kind of political uh, uncomfortableness that I think is so easy to spot maybe the telltale signs of the dysfunctional team are actually easier to spot than how hard it is to do the high functioning team exactly you know 
That's exactly what it is. But I think, you know, to, to end on a positive note with this, I think there's a really high chance for um, all teams that have the awareness at least that something's not right and it could be better to actually work with them to actually become uh, a much more functional team at least, maybe even a really great team. Mm -hmm. As long as the awareness that there is there that something's got to change, I think there's a really big probability that you can actually um, that this team can be supported in actually becoming one, moving from being a group of people who work together to becoming a group of people who um, trust and respect each other. And from there, it's um, almost, you know, it's easy. From there, it's easy. I think you need to uh, get a little tweet out with that uh, great teams are people who uh, don't just work together, but trust and respect each other and date it. Um, it's going to be uh, posted and reposted by lots of other people because it's a <laughs> cool line. <laughs> well, to, be, to give credit where credit's you, it's a quote from Simon Sinek that I have extended because no, the respect just... part is incredibly important. <laughs> but you know, your, your background is open source, so you collaborate, you take something and you add to it and put it back out there. That's all you're doing. That's well said. <laughs> I feel much better with uh, using this quote. <laughs> Brilliant, Frank. I, 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 I believe we'll revisit this topic again. Yes. All right. Brilliant, Frank. We'll, uh, see you next week. <laughs>